Hello. We'll try that again. Welcome back, everybody. Hope you had a good uh, short break, and thank you for joining us for the second panel of the morning. Um, we're going to talk um, now about um, bless you. We're going to talk now about um, how to unlock profitability in charging, um, and um, we're going to. Uh, we've got new partners with the EV Summit here. Um, which is um, one of the rising brands uh, in the e-mobility ecosystem, a brand called Campower. And in a second, I'm going to invite Yoshi to tell us about his business and what they're doing. This is a really, really significant um, topic. We've talked quite a lot in the first panel about different use cases for charging and how range is one of the things that people need to get past and how charging is going to help that and so on and so forth. And in this panel here, we're going to talk about if, if uh, that's to happen there's going to need to be profitability for, um, for, for the installers for those charge points and for um, energy brands and so on. So um, this is a really significant subject, strategies to unlock profitability in the charging infrastructure space. Um, we've got a, a really varied panel here today with different points of view on the topic, um, so this, this will be some really good insight for you all. Um, first of all, I've got Yussi Van Hanen, um, the Chief Marketing Officer of Kempower, um, in the middle is Kate Tyrrell, the CEO of ChargeSafe, and then Georgina Reed, uh, Strategic Marketing Director at Mobilize Power Solutions. Before we get into the panel, um, I'm going to hand over to Yussi uh, as our panel keynote. Yussi, please come to the lectern and tell us about your business. All right, good morning from my side. I'm Yussi Vanhanen, I'm the, the CMO of Power, and I'm like one minute away from the nervous breakdown. <laughs> it's a, a simple thing was invited to Oxford to, to speak in front of the, of the English audience. And then I see the Nelson Mandela theater was like choking me out totally. But let's try to do this together. Welcome and happy Halloween to everybody. <laughs> By the way, I, I don't see my slides over there. In that it's empty, so I need to look. So I, I was previously working in a wind power industry, and 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 now two years in the EV business. And somehow to summarize it, that I have seen the movie, that exactly the same kind of development curve, and the same kind of obstacles. And in the beginning of the wind power industry, was before it's coming popular that it needed some government subsidies and systems to, to boost the business. And now, finally, the wind power was getting the grid parity and, and profitable business. The same thing is now happening that governments are, are investing on the infrastructure and supporting the business. But our target is to make this pro, uh, business profitable and, and uh, kind of self-containing or We think that the main thing to attract the people to the charging stations is to make the, the charging experience very positive and seamless and easy for the drivers. And, and uh, that's the key to attract the consumers to the front of our supermarkets and to our convenience stores. There was a bad reputation for the public charging stations because of the bad reliability of the and, and the bad behavior of the stations. That we took this as a number one priority to boost the, the reliability of the stations. And I'm really happy to, to see that also in the UK you have taken a big initiatives to, to have a, a, a boosting the reliability of the, of the charging and the aim is, is to go over 99%. I think that should be the minimum target for the industry to, to be profitable and to be a uh, third of the trust of the drivers that are coming into our charging stations. Short animation how the Kempower uh, charging works, that we have a centralized power electronics and distributed satellite system. And when the drivers and different cars are coming into the station, we allocate the power uh, for the cars according to their demand. And there you can see that the, the charging curves are overlapping and interleaving for each other. And that's the way to optimize the utilization 
of the, of the charging station. We have calculated that this is leading for the smaller investment on the site, roughly 30% smaller grid connection needed than the traditional systems, but also uh, many retail customers are charging more revenue with distributed, di distributed charging. It's extremely powerful concept and actually what we have realized according our data that the consumers and EV drivers, they don't need that much power average what we are installing there. So the, because the charging curves are so peaky and curvy that, that the average charging power is relatively low. Very difficult to see what I wrote here. The difference between the, that we have lots of data to, to compare different beha customer behavior and the different charging sites. And this is a very busy site from the Norway. And uh, just as an example that how the, how the drivers are using the charging site in the CPO, charge point operator sites in the Norway. And that, that kind of massive amount of data and analysis we can utilize to, to unlock the revenue sources and uh, also bringing a new uh, revenue streams for the, for the retail chains. And this last example is uh, one Finnish retail location and you can compare the difference quite nicely with the CPO side and the retail location where actually people are charging more through, throughout the week and uh, charging powers are relatively lower than the CPO side. Just as an example, there's a lot of data there. I leave it there for a while, but uh, my five minute introduction is over. So thank you every, everybody and let's continue the discussion. Well done, you see, thank you very much for ba you. I made it. battling through your data. You more than made it, more than made it. <laughs> made, my, made my Halloween, thank you. Uh, right, that was fun. Um, we're going to um, get into some of the questions on the, on, the, on the panel now, and we talked about strategies for unlocking profitability. There's quite a complicated um, chain of an op different opportunities for profitability, and actually that's evidenced by some of the data on those last couple of charts, charts there. But I want to start with a super basic uh, question, and I'm going to start on the end with, um, with Georgina and just make our way along here, um, which is... Kind of, uh, seems really simple, but I don't know that we know the answer. Let's find out. Um, we all in the room know that public charging um, will be the first or second objection for people who are rejecting uh, the transition to an electric car. Actually, just as an aside, we ran some research earlier on this year in Autotrader. We found it was the second biggest issue for people who have access to off-street parking. So people with driveways, we found, one of the biggest groups of drivers in, in, in the UK. Um, the, the second biggest reason for people with a driveway who are rejecting an electric car is public charging. They may not even need to use it, but they don't quite realise that. That told us that there's a, there's a perception thing and there's a need thing and all those other sorts of things. So the first question with that sort of stuff in mind is um, how do we know what sort of public charging people need? And I'll ask Georgina first. I, th I think it is not that complicated, and I think it's about um, you know when, when we put in public charging points across the network, we've already measured traffic, you know uh, what the site is about, whether it's a retail park, whether it's on a motorway service station. So already we know this is the route that those 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 vehicles are going already. So we know that that's the best place to put that that charge point. In that area, so it, it isn't it isn't complicated in that respect. I think it's about giving people choice, and that's the issue. I think people have they don't they don't have the choice that they would have traditionally, or even perceived choice that you know perhaps they could go to a Shell garage or a BP garage or whatever it is. They can't do go to a Shell charger or a, or a, you know whatever it is. You know, so I think it's people don't think they have a choice. They do. Um, public charging points are actually really only used for emergency points, you know, or long journeys. So then they're not going to be something that you're going to be completely reliant on anyway. So I think, 
you know, I think it's about dumbing it right down for the, for the, for the driver and not making it complicated because all of that complicated decision-making has already gone ahead for that driver already. Just to follow up on that, it's an interesting point you make on choice, just so we under, I understand that. Um, you know, sometimes you drive down a road and there's a petrol station on one side and then another one on the other side, whatever brands they are. Do you mean that people in a location ought to have the choice between different types and maybe different prices and experiences for charging or that there aren't enough of them or a mix of those sorts of things? Well, I think we, we, when, you're on a, when you're on a motorway service station, you don't really have a choice anyway. You just stop off and, and whether you're paying for petrol or electricity, you're going to be paying a premium amount because you're, paying, you're at a prime site. So you're never going to have that choice of, of, of choosing a cheaper you know, electricity tariff, you know, if you drive further down the road because you're already at that point where you need to charge up. So, but I think perhaps there should be more transparency in the network about pricing and understanding that, you know, you're paying 77 pence a kilowatt rather than maybe if you stopped at the service station down the road, which was 69 pence a kilowatt. So I think transparency of costs, which is what you'd see on the signs at a fuel station, uh, you don't have that. So people are always slightly concerned that they're paying a lot of money for that. But, but be aware, you're, you're charging at a motorway service station, you're going to pay a premium price. Similar to the way you would have done if you had your petrol or diesel car. Absolutely. Thank you. Continue a of course, yeah. That you were asking that how we know or what kind of charging they need. That There's like a, from our company point of view, what, two different strategies that we look at the big data and analyze the data that what, what is the use rates and, and what's the customer satisfaction according to the data. But then the engineers, they always don't have the right solution that we need to talk to the people also. And that we have analyzed quite deeply that what's the human behavior at the charging sites and what they really need. And they want something that is easy. They want something that is, is safe. And those are the key drivers for, for our solutions. I'm glad you used the word safe there because I'm going to come to... To, to Kate now, because you'll probably you <laughs> you'll have a slightly different perspective, or you'll add some 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 variation to mm. these sort of our understanding in the room of, of what people are looking for when it comes to charging. I think what what what's your view? Yeah, I mean it's a completely different experience to just popping some fuel into your car. So um, for me personally, I don't have a charge point at home. I live in a, a terraced house in a built-up city, so I very much rely on um, the Bollard-style charging, which is like 3.5 kilowatt. It will take overnight in order to get me from zero to 100%. Um, they're very popular in the city of Portsmouth um, for sure, and I feel like moving forward fitting in chargers where it's most convenient for the users is, is more than satisfactory. However, on the safety issue, when it comes to the larger scale public charging, such as at motorway service stations, you know, Gretna Green, last time I checked, there was four different networks there, um, which is kind of impressive. But it's the placement, it's the lighting, it's security, it's how much um, footfall you've got or passing traffic, you know, is, is the user going to be seen? Are they going to feel safe? Um, we we're come straight into that time of year again. Um, just a couple of days ago, the clocks have gone back and suddenly it's, it's darker much earlier. Um, so really just that consideration for how do we ensure that our users feel safe where traditionally they're going into beautifully lit forecourts and spending less than five minutes putting a, a, a nozzle in their car. Do, do you think uh, there has been enough consideration? No, absolutely Great. not. <laughs> so tell us a bit more about that, though, because what, it feels a little bit like to me that, you know, we've, we've, there's a bit of rush to get charge points into place. Numbers, people talk about how many do we need, is it this 100,000 or that 100,000 or whatever, and it doesn't feel like that's a thing. That, you know, a, a driver who's wondering about making the switch wants to know different things and they need certain types of reassurances and there are loads of different types of drivers. So what, what's your view on that? Yeah, so we've had a really uniform rollout of petrol stations. Um, we all know we go to a petrol station, it's, it's lit, there's a forecourt, there's a kiosk. Um, they're dotted all over the country. With charging stations, it's vastly different. Um, quite often you will find, and our inspectors do go out to sites and they'll joke with me and say, you know what, I couldn't find find this unit so I thought of the worst possible place I would want to find the unit and there it was right at the very back corner um, nowhere in sight of the uh, hotel reception or, or a restaurant um, so yeah it's they're not well lit from the research that we've done 77% uh, of the sites are, are what we would deem 
as insufficiently lit, being that there is not a light directly over the charge point, that's a really simple fix. Um, and 86.8% are not covered by security cameras. So what we're seeing now, and linking into the profit profitability piece, is these are assets, you know, Kempower, great piece of kit, really expensive, I should imagine, because it's a great piece of kit. Protect it, put a camera over it for your own insurance purposes. If you're a charge point network operator, why are you not protecting your asset? Why are you not protecting your customer? So from a safety perspective, I would like to know that there is a record of me being at a site just in case anything goes wrong. And as a business owner, I would like to know that my kit is being looked after because that's a, a, a big investment to make. Let's, let's ask you about that then, you see, because obviously you've got... You've, you've, you're installing, you've got an investment here and you've got an asset. So a couple of things that have come to mind there. Um, you, you talked about the need for people to be reassured and feel safe. So how do you know that that's what they want? Um, kind of number one. And, and secondly, you know, you've referenced a couple of different markets there, Finland and Norway. Yeah. Are there learnings from those countries that we can bring into to here? We have been running the, the panel uh, service around big quantity of EV drivers. And, there, and then the, the safety of charging sites, it's, it's becoming a, a, a big topic. And in the beginning, this was, a, this was business for the Tesla Bjorns and that kind of enthusiastic people that wanted to, to kind of control and the, every single detail and they, they really know how to do it. But it's becoming a mainstream now. And that's why the safety is becoming more important. That, it's our, our mothers and wives and daughters and, and my brother even, you know, for heaven's sake, he, he needs to go there and try to charge the car but, and, and survive there. So, so normal people go there and normal people are afraid of electricity and you are touching the big cables and that kind of, and, and your, your feet are on the water and, or, or in the slit in Finland. So those are the worries people have about this international perspective what we see now that, that the retail chains and, and the supermarkets they are investing on the charging that people don't want to go anymore for the so much like a distant location for the charging they need to want they want to have them near the the, the kind of convenience stores and the, they are like integrating the charging for their lives that they, they the charging it used to be the last corner in the autobahn and now it's uh, the front door of the supermarket. So it's, it's becoming uh, that, that trend we see everywhere. It's not uh, in, in Finland, uh, Norway, UK also everywhere. That, that. I think as, a, as we are an installation company as well, so we would work with sites to make sure you know, that those particular sites are convenient, safe, um, you know, and a near points where, you know, like an entrance or, a, or maybe a, a CCTV camera or something else. And then Mobilize actually has run out its own sort of charging stations across France, for instance, where, again, it's about putting in charging stations with covered areas, with perhaps a coffee, you know, area that they can go and sit and have a coffee or work or whatever. It's the same as in the UK with GridServe, you know, you have all these hubs now. And I think it is becoming more of the norm. We're not getting just the, you know, the, the charging point stuck at the end of the fuel station in the dark, in the middle of the rain, I think people are starting to see it a lot more. And as, in, as an installation company, we are now very much more aware that actually it is about, as you're going back to this sort, of, this sort of experience thing, you know, actually understanding the experience of the driver, that it's not just about convenience, it's about actually, I'm going to have to sit there for half an hour, so I want to be able to be warm, safe, comfortable, have access to facilities, etc. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. When we started Charge Safe, it was really, um, oh, it must all be the network's fault. And actually, what we've learned in the, in the last two years, we're going to be two in a week, by the way, um, is that it's the installers, it's the network providers, it's the hardware manufacturers, it's the landowners, it's everyone has to collectively have these difficult conversations. You know, this grid connection is over here, but actually, 
it's safer for the chargers to be here and it's more accessible for the chargers to be here. So can we just invest this extra bit of money for a new grid connection, some extra cabling, because this is going to be here for a long time. And actually by paying up a, a little bit more now, you're going to be saving yourself a really expensive retrofitting in the next 10, 15 years. So do it now, make your, your, your network, your assets extremely valuable. And when we get to in about, I reckon the next five to 10 years, when we look at other networks being consolidated and, and acquisitions and mergers happening, those sites are going to be the really attractive ones to competitors looking to come in and, and purchase those assets. So from a business perspective, it makes a lot of sense to do it now. I'd like to come to Georgina on that, actually, mm. given that your installation's in France. We talk, this is about un unlocking profitability. We talked a lot about safety, the consumer experience, and, and so on. Those are, those are hygiene factors and fundamentals which need to be in place and aren't, which will be at some point in the future. With those installations, and they've got coffee shops and roofs and good things, and France is a great place to drive, of course. Um, what's your experience of the different stakeholders and, and who is making profit and how that looks when you're installing in, in somewhere like France? So there are... I think it's, it's exactly the same as when fuel stations came about. The stakeholders are evolving. So um, on CPOs, you've got your venture capitalists, the stakeholders actually providing the investment up front. You've got your hardware suppliers, you've got your installation subcontractors, you've got your DNOs, you've got your, your um, estate managers and, and, and landlords of that land. So. There's a lot of stakeholders involved, and it is not a simple project, whatever you do. So, and then at the end of it, the final stakeholder, and the most important stakeholder, is actually the end user, the driver. So there's all these considerations. As an installation company, we don't just go and fit a unit in, in the middle of somewhere. We have to consider all the different stakeholders, the location, the, the how it's going to be charged. Is it, is it going to be a rapid charge or a fast charger or, or whatever? So... The stakeholders are important, is a very complex thing to, to, to consider when you start installing these units. We have carried out some studies and we have noticed that the EV drivers, they spend more time on the locations where they go than, than normal cars. That they, and then also, since EVs are a little bit more expensive at the moment. The, the people who has an EV, they typically are company cars, so they are a little bit earning more money. So it's a huge attraction for the retail store or convenience store somewhere to, to bring these people so, and, and, and spending more time in your location. So you can see that it's, a, it's an attraction. Is that profit opportunity clear to these different stakeholders, do you think? And if it were, if the answer is no, then if it was, do you think they would maybe run to it a little bit more? Or is this just being driven by the sector, by the charging, charge point operators and so on? It's not clear. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's, this is not a money-making, you know, um, quick fix, multi-millionaire, you know, in, in industry. This is about providing a service. Um, and I think... You know, there is obviously there is money. Everybody who who's it, works in it has to make money, otherwise not going to do it. But it does. It is driven by investment. It's driven by government policy. It's driven by consumer demand. I think. I think my own personal belief is we should go electric. We have to go electric. And at some point, we've got to. You know, the, the sort of the cost. You know, how, who makes the money out of it? It's a. It's a difficult thing at the moment. It's not big money. We're out there to try and provide this network, um, and yes, you know the, the energy companies are you know are going to be the, the main you know um, I think profit organisations in this particular scenario, but I think um, I think generally I think you know we've got to be it, it's, it's difficult to actually pin, pin down that profit in that, in those in those centres. I think it's really important as well to point out that actually nobody's really making any profit right now. There is a lot of investment going into the infrastructure. And just yesterday on LinkedIn, I had a, uh, I saw a comment saying, well, you know, but what about all of these greedy CPOs making a ton of money and, and whacking up their prices? Well, they're not making a ton of money. And actually, Gary's covered this on a fantastic podcast, TV Musings, um, where he discusses the cost to deliver the infrastructure, the unreliability in the energy uh, market pricing. All of this stuff has to be factored in, as well as the costs 
to um, maintain the units and, and deliver the background services like administration, payment for transactions, or the staff that are put on by the, the charge point network operators, as well as rent on the land. That's all costing a lot of money right now. And without the, the masses of EV drivers on the roads using that infrastructure, it really is just investing in what we can do so and trusting that those customers are going to come in time. These businesses are not making any profit right now, but they stand to in the future. That's, uh, that was going to be the question before we go to questions, actually, was um, this all sounds very, very complicated. There is profit to be made over a longer term period for lots of different stakeholders. But what's the, th the thing that we need uh, to happen to give people that reassurance? And you've talked about we need more drivers. The, the cars are coming anyway. There's tons of them coming. There's, there'll be a million on the road by the end of this year and, 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 and there'll be more next year and so on with the ZEV mandate. That's fine. But what's the thing? Do we need something from elsewhere? Do we need stimulus or incentives to make sure that demand speeds up? <coughs> what, what, we, what do we think? Why, how do we make that happen so that everybody's got the reassurance to invest and then therefore they can unlock this profit? Well, I think that the countries that have done very well, Norway, Germany, because they've had government direction, they've had government subsidies, and that's actually pushed that industry forward. We don't have that. Having said that, I think the industry itself is, is going forward on its own, progressing forward, whether you're an OEM producing the EVs, whether you're an installer, whether you're chem power producing the hardware, <laughs> we are still going forward. And I think we're driven to do that. Um, and perhaps at some point, the government and, and local authorities will start to realise actually they have to invest in that, in that infrastructure <coughs> and, that, and that's, that service for their own communities as well. I think it should be seen as, as, as a service rather right. than a necessary. I see that for the public charging, we have all the tools and means already to, to become profitable and companies are investing for their future. What, where we need the, the company, in, uh, the government initiatives now is a truck charging. That 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 will be a, a very fast change when the trucks are are turning electric, and the infrastructure needs to be there that the trucks can come on the roads, and that's where the many countries are, are now putting their in the support money, and that's the right thing to do at the moment. So we're probably further away from that here it feels like in the UK. I wanted to ask you, you've got successful markets that you referenced up there where there is profitability unlocked in charging. Yeah. How has that worked? Why is that, ha why is that successful in these other countries? The, the truck. Uh, no, no, no. When you looked at Norway, it, charging is profitable for all the different stakeholders. What, what's the key thing in that? The volume brings the profitability right. that that certain, when you go up in a volume, certain threshold, then you become profitable. That in the beginning, you need to invest on the future and trust that the volume comes there. That, that, that's, that's one of the key things. And uh, standardizing, making a packages and simplifying the solution, uh, that, that's the way. That. I think it comes down to visibility as well. And, and controversially, what I'm going to ask is that charge point network operators start to really uh, seriously consider putting a sizable marketing budget to one side. Um, I, I appreciate that comes away from installing and delivering on safe and accessible charge points. However, bear with me because we've got oil and gas giants that regularly advertise on our TVs and cinema and print. Um, we're not getting that from charge point network operators right now. If we could see when we switch on the TV, you know, your journey can be just as easy as from the likes of Osprey who use ChemPower Kit, you know, and you can, or GridServe uh, at every motorway service station. That is going to fill the public with more confidence that they are going to get from A to B. Um, I think, yeah, visibility is really key. I like that idea. And before we go to questions, how about the people that have already got sizable marketing budgets, the manufacturers? If we talk a little bit more about how easy it would be to move from A to B rather than the screen and the thing, um, perhaps we would reassure users on the basics and the fundamentals. I agree with you. It feels like to make the transition that we need to make in the time in which we need to make it, there needs to be a much more unified, collaborative approach to getting people to make that sort of change rather than uh, talking about charging here and product here and energy here. Perhaps there's an opportunity to, to, to collaborate a little bit more after this session. Right, we've got time, short time, for a couple of questions. Anyone got their hand up? 
Who wants to offer their marketing budget? Uh, Roland Eminem from Kempar UK. Uh, this is really aimed at Kate, uh, but obviously uh, Georgina and Yusuf, please uh, step in as well. Uh, Kate, you have inspected uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of, uh, of sites, and I know that you don't know the underlying financials of, uh, of a site, but can you summarize from your experience that what makes a popular site, which then logically is probably also a profitable site? Absolutely. So um, again, visibility is really key, and thank you for the question. We have witnessed sites um, at motorway service stations where there are some charges that are not well lit, and there are other charges which are well lit, and people were queuing to use the well lit visible charges, and the unlit charges are not being used. So lighting could not be any more important really light up your sites because not only does it make the user feel more safe but it lets people know that the infrastructure is there so signage making sure it's really easy to find that your users aren't having to drive around in circles trying to identify where the charging points are and then really um, uh, just super simple things like the the handshake so icons to um, demonstrate exactly how to initiate a charge making sure the payment is super accessible nice easy quick tap tap and go um, we don't need five different apps I don't want to tell you what my mother's maiden name is my dog's date of birth I just want to tap and I want to go um, so yeah make it really uh, simple accessible visible um, and inclusive Question. Thank you. Anyone else with a question before we break for your next break? There's a, no, that's the cameraman. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Well, no, no more questions. Right. In that case, I would like to ask you to thank the panelists. Thank you very much to Georgina, Kate, and Yussi. And please be come back in here at noon.